Yeah, excellent. All right, so lone pair, extra lone pair in oxygen is going to reach over, interact with the carbon that, the other electrophilic carbon that holds the chlorine, kicks the chlorine out, right, and that gets us to the product. And if you want to keep track of the atoms here, it's, I, I, I recommend doing this, right, whenever you're going from a, a linear structure to a cycle, right, or you're opening a ring going from a cycle back to a linear structure, it's always good to number your, your atoms. Right? This tells you how big of a ring you need to make. So one, two, three, four, five, six, right? That's telling us we need to make a six-membered ring, right? And then go over here, one, two, Right, so this is the bond that was made in that second step. Right, and then you can see on carbon two in the intermediate, we have a methyl group coming off of carbon two, so we'll need a methyl group coming off of carbon two in the product as well. Questions about this? So uh, I was asking you for this second step here, right? Is this going to be an SN1 or an SN2 mechanism? SN2. SN2. How many people agree it's SN2? Okay. Uh, the two in SN2. What does that mean? Good. How many molecules are here? Right, so, so this, is, this is a trick question, right? And this kind of drives home the point. It's not about how we draw the arrows, right? It's really about the kinetics and what's involved in, in, the, in the reaction, right? So this is a case where, yeah, we, we're drawing an SN2 type mechanism, but this cannot be a bimolecular reaction or a bimolecular step because there's only one molecule, right? So this is technically, even though it, it looks like an SN2 mechanism, technically a unimolecular substitution. Does that make sense to everybody? Can I ask a question? Sure, yeah. Uh, you're talking about specifically only the second step, the unimolecular substitution, or are you saying overall you should only count this as SN? So, uh, for, the, for the second step of the mechanism. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. questions about that? Really important point, right? We can't have, if we don't have two different molecules, we can't have a bimolecular mechanism. All right, so let's, um, let's kind of return to where we, we started, or where, uh, where we ended on Friday, looking at how the, sh the structure of the electrophile is going to affect the type of substitution or the pathway that that substitution proceeds through, right? And we looked at <clears throat> the SN2 uh, mechanism, right? We looked at the orbitals involved in the SN2 reaction, the bimolecular reaction, right? And hopefully everybody can understand why the less substitution you have on the electrophile, the more likely it is to go through SN2, right? So let's just take a, a minute or two and review that. We're going to have to contrast this with the SN1 mechanism. And we're going to just look at two electrophiles. We'll look at the primary and the tertiary, right? We'll, we'll hopefully from this we can understand the overall trend from methyl on to tertiary, right? And the nucleophile that we're going to use um, is just going to be some generic nucleophile, we'll just call it nuke, right? It goes 
cases. And we saw that whenever the nucleophilic addition or nucleophilic substitution occurs, right, we're taking the homo of the nucleophile and we're going to add that to the lumo of the electrophile. And the lumo of the electrophile is going to be the carbon leaving group sigma star orbital. Okay, and all SN2 reactions. Okay, and that's always going to be sticking off the opposite ends of that carbon leaving group bond. Right, that's always going to be the arrangement of that orbital. And so whenever the nucleophile adds, right, we're not going to specify what the, what the homo is just because we're using a generic nucleophile. Whenever that nucleophile adds, it has to add from the backside of that bond, right? And we call this appropriately backside attack. state for this step. Right? And that transition state would represent, or would, would be represented by the highest energy point on this NS, SN2 energetic pathway. Right? And we rationalize that the more stuff, the more cabbage you have around that electrophilic center, right, the harder, harder it is for that nucleophile to interact with that orbital. Right? It's got to push more stuff out of the way. It's going to be interacting with much more electron density. Right? So that's going to increase the energy of that step. Right? So if we're comparing, draw this a little bit lower here. If we're comparing addition to a primary electrophile with the addition to a tertiary electrophile, right? hopefully everybody can understand why the tertiary addition or sub substitution would be much slower, right? And so slow that it, it's not a, a reaction that we can carry out you know, with any um, reasonable success in the lab. Questions about this? Everybody's okay with this concept? Yeah. All right. So that explains the, the trend of SN2 relative to the structure of the electrophile. Tertiary uh, SN1 mechanism is going to, or the SN1 mechanism on tertiary, tertiary electrophiles is going to be the most successful. So let's just quickly draw out the mechanism. So I'm, I'm just choosing some random electrophile. Right? First step of the SN1 mechanism is going to be loss of the leaving group. of the nucleophile to that carbocationic center. Right. 
and that gets us to our product. When we looked at the energy of this reaction, or of this mechanism, reflect those two steps with two separate energetic steps, right? And two different transition states. Right? For this mechanism that we that we've shown here. Right? And it's important to note that that first step, right, the loss of leaving group, loss of the bromide, that's going to be the rate limiting step of the reaction. Right, so the highest energy, right, first step is slow, the second step is going to happen really fast. As soon as that carbocation is formed, right, the nucleophile is going to be able to react with it almost immediately. Okay, so it's that first step that determines the rate of the reaction. So to understand um, uh, how the electrophile affects the course of the SN1 reaction, we need to better understand the relative stability of different carbocations. is like this, right? So the tertiary carbocation is going to be more stable than the secondary, which is going to be more stable than the primary, which is going to be more stable than the metal. So if we look at the structure of a carbocation, right, let's just look at a tertiary carbocation. So there's our tertiary carbocation, right? That center is represented just by a, a vacant p orbital. Right? And we'll compare that to a, let's say, a primary carbocation.
Now, looking at these two structures, thinking back to last semester where we learned about um, elements of stabilization, why would a tertiary be lower in energy, more stable than a, a primary? First of all, why, why don't we just lay out what makes carbocations high energy to begin with? Why would they be high energy species? Good, they have a formal charge. I would say it's, it's mostly because that carbon does not have its full octet of electrons, right? There are not eight electrons around that. Okay, there's a vacant p orbital that's ready to react with anything that can give that carbon its full octet. All right, so source of instability really comes from that empty p orbital. Right, so why would the tertiary, looking at these two structures, why would the tertiary be more stabilized than the primary. Right. Um, so the carbon is attached to a hydrogen. It's less likely to be able to work less polarized with bonds, so it has more electron like charge. Um, so, so I could, I could um, rationalize that another way. I can say that carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen. So from these bonds, it gets more electron density than it would from these bonds, right? And so I could rationalize based on that, that this should be more stable than that, right? Based on just electronegativity and bond polarity. So it's not, it's not that, Evan. Yep? Yeah? So due to hyperconjugation. Explain. Um, <coughs> because we have the two orbital electron that interact with the anti-bonding orbitals on three groups instead of just the one. Right, so not anti-bonding orbitals, but oh, it's, yeah, it's bonding orbitals. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, good. Good. Right, so how many of you remember the concept of hyperconjugation, or at least the word? Okay, that's good. All right, so this is a case where we have sigma orbitals, right, that are surrounding and kind of lining up with that empty p orbital. And whenever you have two orbitals, one filled and one unfilled, right, that are aligned, they can overlap with each other. Right, trying to kind of creating two new orbitals, but most importantly, stabilizing the electrons in the sigma bond orbital. Right, so in your tertiary, in your tertiary um, carbocation, right, we have three elements of hyperconjugation. We have three sigma bonding orbitals in these carbon hydrogen bonds. And they don't have to be carbon hydrogen, right? They could be carbon carbon, they could be uh, carbon nitrogen, they could be you know, any number of things. As long as there's sigma electrons, sigma bonding electrons in that area that can line up with the empty orbital, right? We can stabilize that empty orbital, more or less stabilizing the electrons in the, in the sigma bond, right? So in tertiary uh, carbocations, we have three elements of hyperconjugation. Secondary electrons, we only have two carbon groups, right? <clears throat> this hydrogen here doesn't have any bonds coming off of it, so we only have two elements of hyperconjugation, right? Primary, we only have one element of hyperconjugation, right? For methyl, we have three hydrogens, nothing's coming off of those hydrogens, right? So there's absolutely no hyperconjugative stabilization in methyl carbocation. Questions about that? Make sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay, so the greater the substitution around the carbocation, right, the more stable it's going to be. And so what does that look like energetically? Carbocation. 
right? If we're comparing this to a secondary carbocation or a primary carbocation, where would we, what would the energy diagram look like? Or how would the energy diagram change? Okay. I'm missing more energy. Good, right? So if we're forming a secondary carbocation, we would expect the energy of that secondary carbocation to be higher up, right? Greater energy, or uh, less stable, higher potential energy. And that's really important for the first step because the higher the energy of the intermediate, the more energy we need for the activation of that step to make it. And so how does that manifest in the reaction? What is that, what is that, what's, how does that affect the reaction? Different equilibrium, yep. The higher activation energy. Okay, and so what does that mean for the actual reaction? So the like reaction is going to be slow. Good, slower, slower reaction rate. about uh, what happens to a primary carbocation, right? Primary carbocations are going to be up here, right? And the activation energy needed to form that carbocation is going to be even higher, right? The rate of that formation is going to be even slower, right? And we see the same trend with, with the methyl uh, electrophile. Yeah. Does that change the thermodynamics of the reaction? Just the kinetics. Yeah, thermodynamics is going to, I mean, it, it changes the thermodynamics of the intermediate formation, right. right, but not the overall reaction. Other questions? All right, so let's, let's um, compare these, SN1 and SN2, on an energy diagram just by looking at the structure of the electrophile. Right? And hopefully this ties a lot of things together. Right, so draw out a, a wide energy diagram. make our product or our starting material somewhere in the middle. All right, what we'll do is we'll have the SN2 uh, reaction going off to the left. Right, and the SN1 reaction we'll have going off to the right. And we're first going to think about, um, say, the, the methyl um, substitution. Okay, so for substitution of a methyl electrophile, right, just an H3C with maybe an iodine hanging off of it, right, what is that going to look like in the SN2 mechanism, in the SN2 diagram? How easily will a nucleophile be able to interact with this carbon? Yeah, relatively easy, right? So that would mean you know, relatively low activation barrier, right, for that SN2 reaction. Right, what about the SN1? Right, 
need to draw an intermediate here, so where would we draw that intermediate? Uh, it's impossible, but we'll, we'll say that it's, it's, uh, it, it's just very improbable, right? So the, the energy of the intermediate, yeah, right. the energy of the intermediate would be really high, right? Good. So this energy diagram here, right, explains why when you start with a metal electrophile, the substitution that takes place occurs through an SN2 mechanism, right? It's not because the SN1 mechanism can't happen, it's just that it happens so slowly, right, that it's not going to occur as much in this, or really at all, uh, in, this, in this case. Right? If we look at the methyl, or sorry, the, the primary. Right, so we'll do a blue line here. Right, SN2. Right, we expect the activation energy to be higher. Okay, what about the SN1? Yeah. Good, be lower than the methyl. Right, but we, we still know that for, for primary electrophiles, SN2 reactions are going to be the predominant mechanism pathway, right? So that means that the activation energy for the methyl electrophile in the SN1 still has to be much higher than that in the SN2. Right? Secondary, right? this is the one that's kind of moderate or it's complicated for both. Right? Here we can say it's going to depend upon other things in the structure, other things uh, in the reaction, the nucleophile and the leader group. Right? And so what we'll do is we'll say that for the SN2 reaction, the energy needed to accomplish this is going to be about the same as it would be in the SN1 reaction. Right? So if you're an electrophile, you can see Greatest line, but at this point, right, you kind of have the option, and there are going to be other factors in the reaction that influence whether that reaction goes through an SN2 pathway, right, an SN1 pathway, or sometimes a mixture can occur, right? Reactions can occur through multiple different pathways if the energies of those pathways are somewhat equivalent, right? And then finally, we have our tertiary. If you don't have different colored pens, you could just label everything primary, secondary, tertiary, right? And now here you can see that for the tertiary, the SN2 pathway is a much higher activation energy, a much slower mechanism than the SN1 pathway, right? And all of these SN1s, first transition state, right, that's going to be the rate limiting step, right, in all of them. And so I've tried to draw these so that it's clear that that first step is higher than the second step. If you were to do this on the exam, I would expect you know, that to be the same, that it needs to actually be apparent that that first step is higher than the second step. My question is about this. All right, so let's quickly talk about leaving groups. 
um, just because we have a, a few minutes left, so I don't want to get into anything too in depth. All right, so the leading groups that we see uh, in, in these uh, nuclear fuel substitution reactions are typically going to be halides. Uh, protonated hydroxy groups, or water, um, and then another class that we'll go over is sulfonate esters. Or sulfonates. And really what you want to know is that the better the leaving group, Right? So things with really good leaving groups like iodide, right? Big, really big atom, really fuzzy, really polarizable when it leaves as an ion, right? These are going to be really good electrophiles, and the substitutions that occur with these are going to typically be fast. SN1 or SN2, right? If we look at chlorides, these are typically not good electrophiles for aliphatic substitution anyway. Right? And so we don't see these being used very often, only in very special, in very special cases. Right? Chlorides, bromides, iodides are kind of the standard for alkyl substitution. Okay. Um, next class we'll get into water as a leaving group. Right? Water as a leaving group we typically only see in SN1 chemistry. Right? Not always, but, but that's usually the case. And then I'll, I'll, we'll also talk about sulfonates, and then we'll get into looking at nuclear files and some other factors. Questions about anything from today? I'll see you guys uh, tomorrow for that.